Richard Holler at the Historic Grandin Theater is a live storytelling series that's the brainchild of Roanoker Lee Hunsaker. The theme for this episode is The Body. Tellers share tales of lost limbs, negative attitudes about our own bodies, and how to overcome medical and psychological adversity. Blue Ridge PBS Echo is pleased to share these moving stories. Please note that the opinions expressed do not necessarily reflect those of Blue Ridge PBS or the Echo Channel, and be advised that some of the stories contain graphic language and stories about mental and physical abuse, so viewer discretion is advised. A first-time hoot and holler but certainly not a novice storyteller. She's a former longtime resident of the Roanoke Valley, now lives on a remote island 26 miles from the coast of North Carolina. She's the author of a recently released memoir, The Wounds That Bind Us, which is out in the lobby. Get it. You're going to want to after this. Which tells the improbable and powerful true story of a single mother with prosthetic legs who travels the globe with her young daughter in a Land Rover to bring light to the plight of landmine survivors in war-torn countries. Her writing has been published in many places, including the New York Times, but she believes that her most important work has been raising her two children to become kind and compassionate members of the human family. I am beyond honored to welcome Kelly Shin. I want you all to know that that's shin with two ends and no shins. Can't make that up. Long before I became legless or knew that I would become a writer, I knew that words mattered, that they mattered more than limbs, that words are more than a simple mode of communication, but that they are ways to wield power in the forms of love, compassion, and sometimes cruelty. I was born with legs, an orphan with legs, and I don't know the story of my birth except that I was born to a 15-year-old girl at a home for unwed mothers at the tail end of the baby scoop era, three decades of American history in which an estimated four million young women were shamed into secrecy and had their babies sold as commodities. I've never forgotten the first time I came across my adoption papers and saw the words that mattered, receipt for full payment of Caucasian female infant, $250. I like to imagine my birth. I like to imagine a nun catching me as I flop from my birth mother's vagina. I like to imagine her counting all 10 of my toes in Latin, wiggling each one while reciting the rhyme about piggies who stay home, eat roast beef, have none. Unos porcos, duo porcos, tres porcos. <laughs> Do you know that the Latin word for pig, porcos, also refers to gluttony and the female genitalia? When I started to speak, I had an impediment. I struggled to pronounce many letters, particularly R's and L's, and my adoptive parents took me to a Norman Rockwellian doctor who told them, you probably bought yourself an Irish orphan. A lot of them are tongue-tied. Then he had my adoptive mother hold me down while he pulled out my tongue with some tongs and cut the lingual frenum, the string of tissue that connects the underside of the tongue to the floor of the mouth. Frenum comes from the Latin word for bridle. That doctor unbridled me, made sure that when I found my voice, I would speak so that people could understand. I tasted blood for days. My father used to say that when I was young and leaning, learning to read, I'd find a new word and hide in the closet and say it repeatedly, and then I'd come out and try to use it in a sentence. I remember loving the word pocket the way it felt on my frenum-freed tongue. I loved pockets, too, especially on overalls. Pocket is a diminutive Anglo-Norman word that means little pouch. I have a pocket in my brain that I fill with words, and sometimes it gets too full and spills into the reservoir of my heart. The bigger I got, the bigger words were added to the pocket. At 16, I learned the word histrionic, meaning exaggeratedly dramatic. One day, I was a star cross-country runner, 
and the next I ran a fever of 104 and felt like I was going to die in an emergency room. I was scared and loud and the doctor sent me home with Tylenol and wrote in the medical chart, histrionic teenage girl with the flu. Twelve hours later, I had purple patches all over my body and a spinal tap at a second hospital revealed that I had acquired bacterial meningitis and sepsis. And then, the same month that the Americans with Disabilities Act was passed into law, I had my legs amputated. It was hard enough to be a 16-year-old girl in the dawn of Victoria's Secret and the heyday of Jeffrey Epstein. It was exquisitely harder with freshly amputated pins. In the world of romance, though, disability is a wonderful bullshit detector. To be crippled means that you can part the sea of shallow people like Moses. If you flinch at my use of the word cripple, I get it. It's historically a derogatory term. But etymologically speaking, it simply means to have difficulty walking. I like the simplicity of that definition as much as I like the alliteration. Cripple, pocket, you gotta love those plosives and fricatives. And even though being a crippled teenage girl weeds out the shallows, it doesn't keep you from losing your virginity to rape by a stranger in the back parking lot of a bar 20 years before you learn that disabled women are victims of sexual assault at three times the rate of women without disability. But your love for new words and your inherent will to live will also find you lovers that see that what you have lost in the flesh you have gained in the soul. Lovers that know that the humble house is often filled with more love than any mansion. After my legs were amputated, I replaced running with racing, specifically off-road racing. I replaced two legs with a four by four. Eventually, I worked for a year as an off-road instructor in England, and one day I met a man whose bravado and wit humored me, and over a pool table, we made a bet about a date, and I sunk the white ball on purpose. <laughs> he lived about an hour away, and so I rented a hotel room and traveled his direction, and I didn't tell him about the hotel room, but I also hadn't told him about my legs. You see, back then, I wore boots and jeans and went to great lengths to hide my prosthetics because it was still the heyday of supermodels with no visible disabilities. And even though I was never going to walk down a runway in a miniskirt, I was going to hide the fact that I couldn't. We'd planned to meet at a pub in the town square, and as I was walking toward it, I found myself wanting to turn back. Despite all the excuses I was making in my head for why this was a bad idea, Truth is that I was frightened to tell this man with whom I had a genuine connection and attraction that I had no legs. I was frightened that I'd come this far and that after I told him he would spend an hour in polite small talk, then bow out with a bad excuse and ghost me. So he's at the bar when I walk in and his eyes catch mine and I can see that he's also making a vulnerable leap toward connection. So we drink some beer and avoid the hard heart talks, instead choosing to laugh and entertain an inebriated redhead. At some point in the night, Date had bought me two beers and Redhead bought me three, but Redhead, she spilled the third one on us both and, and then suddenly became distracted by the music and left us to dance. And that's when I found the nerve, or numbed the nerve enough, to tell Date about my legs. He said he'd had no idea, that he suspected I may have worn a knee brace, and he was curious and kind and a little buzzed himself, and so I left him to soak it up and I took another beer to the dance floor where Redhead and I shook the bones we had. Date eventually joined us, and when he pulled me in close for a kiss under those disco lights, I knew we were golden, and I also knew that I was drunk. <laughs> so the pub shouts last call, and I hear last fall, and we stumble out the door onto this cobblestone road where Date spots a man who looks just like him, and I begin to feel dizzy by the swirling lights reflected in the cobblestones. I hear him shout to the man, brother, how are you? This is the American bird I was telling you about. The man hugs Date and looks at me from over Date's shoulder and says, oh, legless. I get a sinking feeling in my gut and start stumbling away back toward the hotel, feeling all hurt. By the time Date catches up with me and takes my arm in his own to keep me steady, my anger subsides. 
When he walks me to my hotel room and kisses me in the elevator, I forget entirely about the cobblestones, the legless comment, the fear. And when I wake in his arms in the, in a, when I wake in his arms in the light of a sunspoke after hours and hours of unbridled, frenum-filled passion, I remember the swirling lights and I slap him in the chest. He sputters awake, surprised by the slap, gives me what for, and I ask him, how did he know I was legless? Who was that man? You said you didn't know, were you lying? Date leans back laughing while my heart is in my throat. Dear one, he says between chuckles, in jolly old England, to be legless means you're drunk. I love humor, <laughs> which I often refer to as the helpmate of hope. What do you call a woman with one leg? Eileen. <laughs> what do you call a woman with no leg legs? It don't matter, she ain't coming anyway. I've told these jokes countless times now that I've discarded the pretense and the boots and I've learned to present my body without shame. And yet there are still times in certain situations when I try to hide my comfort in this body because I know how much words matter. Since the beginning of affirmative action, most applications in American life require you to fill out questions relating to demographics, race, gender, sexual preference, disability. And even though these forms are meant to protect vulnerable persons, I've always cowered at them, despised them for reasons unclear, refuse to fill them out except for the race question where I always draw a little box, check it, and write next to it the category of human. The word human comes from the late Middle English, meaning humane, to have or show compassion or benevolence. That's a word worth sticking in your pocket. To be a disabled woman is to know what it is to be treated inhumanely. In 2012, the United Nations recognized that women with disabilities are at a considerably greater risk of violence, neglect, and exploitation. That nearly 80% of disabled women will be the victim of sexual violence in their lifetimes. That a quarter of disabled mothers are likely to lose custody of their children, have a more difficult time finding adequate housing, gainful employment. The list goes on as long as human cruelty. And the fact that I have experienced all these statistical hardships on some level unnerves me. It takes me to a sorrowful place, one that is raw and legless and vulnerable. It lays me bare before the death wall. These questionnaires that are meant to protect so-called vulnerable people also set them up for abhorrent cruelty. When the United Nations creates a program to help end violence against disabled women, they must also define them. A professor from the University of Massachusetts who specializes in genocide says that by their very nature, these definitions create a, a human subgroup, and this is the realm where human devaluation begins. He wrote that when devaluation becomes a part of a culture, its literature, art, and media, and perpetuated in social institutions, it becomes highly resistant to change. Even when its public expression is quiet, it remains part of the deep structure of that culture and can reemerge when a scapegoat or ideological enemy is needed. This is as true for folks with disabilities as it is for African Americans, the LGBTQIA community, for Jews, Palestinians, and even white men. Any among us who bear any distinctive uh, marks of identity, which is all of us. Do you remember The Sneetches by Dr. Seuss? It's a story about creatures called Sneetches who live on beaches. Some Sneetches have stars on their bellies while others do not. A sly character named McMonkey McBean offers a machine to add or remove stars, causing confusion and rivalry among the Sneetches. In the end, they learn a valuable lesson about the silliness of prejudice and the importance of acceptance. I think about the Sneetches a lot whenever I read the news. I think about hopelessness in the light of continued genocide. I quote Dr. Seuss out loud to the headlines. That day, all the Sneetches forgot about stars and whether they had one or not upon theirs. 
I think about the female astrophysicist who discovered in the late 1950s that all the elements of Earth, including humans, are composed of the elements that come from stars, that we are all made of stardust. I think that on the next forum I am asked to fill out, I'll draw a box and I'll create a new race. I'll call it stardust. Star, a word in my pocket that matters, a word that comes from the Greek aster, a word that means heavenly body. Yeah.